Are you creative but feeling stuck? Your creativity feels blocked and the demands of life have broken you down? Have you ever wondered how to tap into the deepest levels of creativity and how to psychologically maintain yourself while you bring your creations to life? In this video, we'll uncover how to release your creative daemon. This process will enable you to not only create the greatest things you have ever produced, but to also become the greatest person you could possibly be. Carl Jung calls this process individuation. I call this process self-creation. So we'll also look at Carl Jung's psychology in relation to the creative process and how this links in with self-actualization. This will ensure that you can give birth to the greatest creations. We will also explore contemporary psychological research to understand the underlying structures of motivation that link with creativity. We will explore the psychological understanding of the creative personality, including understanding the best environment for a creative person to be in. The goal here is to harness the creative energy within your unconscious so that you are full of life again, so that you have the energy and power to create. I will go through specific steps to help you gain access to your creative energy to help you release your daemon. The energy you lack right now is trapped in your unconscious, and it really has to do with how you relate to yourself and how you relate to the world. Your sense of self can impact your energy levels, can impact your self-confidence. Once you understand what I'm talking about, your self-confidence will improve, your energy levels will become higher, your motivation will improve. But I have to warn you, anything that rises high can fall down low. This requires wisdom. This is not for everyone. This is for people who want to become great, who want to create something beyond what is normally expected. This is for people who want to take up the call from their daemon. This is for you if you want to release your genius. To gain access to exclusive cutting-edge full-length lessons, become a member of my Patreon. These lessons will help you tap into psychological insights and implement practical strategies so that you can progress along your journey in life. Don't let your ego hold you back from becoming initiated into the hidden secrets. Let this be your new start in life, your rebirth. Head over to my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Jared Chan. Firstly, what is a daemon? The word daemon comes from ancient Greece and it means the lacerator, he who divides and fractures. Etymologically, it means to divide, then to assign. Mythologically, the daemon is a guiding spirit. It is the being that gives us our fate and helps us fulfill our destiny. In this sense, the daemon assigns us our vocation in life and fills us full of energy, motivating us to create and reach our potential. The Romans had a comparable concept that they called the genius. The genius presides over a person much like the Christian idea of a guardian angel and would guide a person throughout their life. The Romans also had the idea of a genius loci of a divine spirit that presides over a particular place or location. The comparable concept in Arabia is the jinn or genie. The jinn would inspire pre-Islamic philosophers and poets and are sometimes depicted as good and other times as evil. However, it is important to understand that the Greek idea of the daemon is not the same as a demon. The daemon is an amoral being in the sense that it can lead you into dangerous situations but it is mostly seen as a positive guide to help you fulfill your purpose. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, the character of a human is the daemon, or in other words, an individual's character is their fate. This idea links personality and fate with the daemon. According to Plato, the daemon is the mediator between the gods and man. They guide people through their lives and can dispense this guidance through experiences of divination and dreams. For Socrates, he experienced his daemon as a voice speaking to him directly, warning him to stop when he ought to and guiding him on his mission to teach. This intermediary function forms a bridge between the mundane everyday world and the divine realms that make up the world of the gods. In Plato's myths of the afterlife, the daemon also performs a function to help guide the person through their journey to the underworld. In Plato's work, we see that God has given each person a daemon that inhabits the body and lifts up the higher aspects of a person, the higher self, connecting the heavenly in us with heaven. From this perspective, the daemon is a part of ourselves, not our usual sense of self we would call the ego, but our broader sense of self, the aspect that forms a bridge to the divine, the transpersonal self. Those who have a strong connection to the divine, who listen to their daemon, 
experience within themselves and exude outside of themselves a sense of wonder. However, this wonder that is induced in others can cause positive and negative reactions from people. In the case of Socrates, following this daemon ultimately led to him being put to death. Despite the fact that the daemon can put you in danger, Plato suggests that human flourishing is being well with one's daemon and encourage people to learn how to keep the daemon living inside themselves in a well-ordered manner, as this would lead to eudaimonia, or supreme happiness. What was Carl Jung's thoughts on the daemon? Jung refers to the daemon in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, where he says, Hence, I prefer the term the unconscious, knowing that I might equally well speak of God or daemon if I wish to express myself in mythic language. When I do use such mythic language, I am aware that manna, daemon, and God are synonyms for the unconscious. That is to say, we know just as much or just as little about them as about the latter. This lets us know that Jung took the idea of the daemon as being a personification of the unconscious. Mana, daemon, and god are all mythic words that refer to what Jung means by the unconscious, specifically the libido energy built up in the unconscious. Yet, when we use the term unconscious, it gives us a flat scientific kind of affect, though when we use the term god or daemon, the personification holds a stronger feeling. We can see Jung talk about this benefit when he says, The great advantage of the concepts of daemon and god lies in making possible a much better objectification of the vis-a-vis, namely a personification of it. Their emotional quality confers life and effectuality upon them. Hate and love, fear and reverence, enter the scene of the confrontation and raise it to a drama. What is merely being displayed becomes acted. The whole man is challenged and enters the fray with his total reality. Only then can he become whole, and only then can God be born. That is, enter into the human reality and associate with man in the form of man. By this act of incarnation, man, that is, his ego, is inwardly replaced by God, and God becomes outwardly man, in keeping with the saying of Jesus, Who sees me? sees the father. Jung here is hinting at the process of giving birth to the products of the unconscious through consciousness. More specifically, he's talking about the libido energy that builds up in the unconscious, that we personify as a daemon or god and that we give birth to, metaphorically speaking, when the libido reaches consciousness and seeks real influence through our lives. Just as Jung refers to Jesus when he said, who sees me sees the father, It is this exact psychodynamic state that you are going to be able to configure in your own life. This process is what we are going to learn about as we continue along this journey. Because once you master the death and birth process of the libido, once you understand the principles of the mind to facilitate this process and to avoid being stuck or even harmed, you will be able to have access to this libido energy hidden in your unconscious you will become more conscious through this process. You will form a relationship with your daemon, and your daemon will help guide you to your destiny. As Jung says, For it is the function of consciousness, not only to recognize and assimilate the external world through the gateway of the senses, but to translate into visible reality the world within us. The benefit of personifying the unconscious as a daemon or god is that the personification forms a protection while undergoing the process of synthesizing the conscious and unconscious contents. This ensures the ego is not inflated. It identifies the newly found energy flowing into consciousness as not generated from itself, but rather from a higher, greater being. It is highly important that we cover these principles of the mind, because if you are not conscious of the dangers of the unconscious and the dangers of the creative function within the psyche, then you can fall victim to it. If you want to become more conscious and become more powerful and creative, you have to take seriously the following ideas that Carl Jung lays out about the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. With great power comes great responsibility. To the degree you have power, you have a corresponding responsibility to yield that power correctly. And so this applies to the power within your unconscious. 
of which we're going to attempt to gain access. In the seminars on Nietzsche's Zarathustra, Jung discusses the creative impulse and how a creative person should best relate with it when he says, you experience that great relief when you realize that you are not identical with the creative power. For instance, if Nietzsche could have realized that he was not identical with Zarathustra, I don't know what it might not have done for his brain. To feel that you are the creator is a terrible burden, hellish anguish, provided of course that you are creator enough to feel it consciously. The creator is usually like a child that just plays with the gods and can produce the most awful monster without seeing it. Many artists can only produce because they don't know what they are producing. The moment they know, the creation is completely stopped. For then they begin to reflect. Then they feel responsible and cannot play like the gods, unless they fulfill the psychological demand that they dissociate themselves from the creation, from the archetype, from the creative impulse itself. If they can do that, they can go on creating. Then they can allow the god to play. It needs a certain faculty, the art to live amorally. If any kind of morality is caught up with the creative impulse, it simply cannot work, and it will destroy you. On the other hand, if you destroy the creative impulse, you will destroy the intrinsic value of the individual at the same time, but you can still live on as a wall decoration. We can see here a few important points that Jung makes on the psychology of creative production. Firstly, you are not identical with the creative power. Don't puff up your ego, thinking you are the creative function. You are the source of life. You are the creator of all things, because you are not. You are the vessel. You are the artist. You are the writer. You are the skilled craftsman who is allowing your daemon to work through you. That's the distinction. You can only create if you disassociate from the archetype, the creative impulse itself, and let it create through you. Focus on doing your work, but do not identify with it. That's the psychodynamic principle you must understand. That is the proper ordering of the relationship between the ego and the archetype of the self. The next lesson from Jung that is hard to accept is that amorality is required for creation, or it will destroy you. The daemon is amoral, the unconscious is amoral, the primordial god is amoral. Therefore, both good and evil will come through your creative work, as they are inherent aspects of the whole. It is best not to get entangled with it. Your only responsibility is to bring it forth. For example, the creative impulse that brought forth the entire scientific enterprise was an amoral process that resulted in technology that is both destructive and positive for humanity. So your job is to bring forth what is within you. Just as a scientist's job is to bring forth what they discover. Now, whatever broader technologies or impacts come from that discovery is not up to you. Rather, that is in the hands of the broader culture around you. Lastly, Jung lets us know that if you destroy your creative impulse and you do not give birth to what is within you, then you destroy your intrinsic value. The value within is lost and you become nothing more than a hollow life. Psychologically speaking, according to Jung, Zarathustra is Nietzsche's daemon, which is equivalent to the old wise man archetype. Jung claims that Nietzsche has a megalomanic pathology because he identifies too closely with this inner figure Zarathustra. We can see this when Jung says, You see, the daemon was very careful to forewarn him. That is, the prophetic voice of the seer in our unconscious, usually symbolized by the wise old man. So the daemon is the superman, the thing that is greater than man, yet it seems to be in man. If you have some vision or premonition, you are tempted to assume that you are perhaps the wise old man yourself, and then one calls it an inflation. Nietzsche himself was in the condition for an inevitable inflation. That explains his almost pathological megalomania, which was criticized during his lifetime. That megalomanic manner of speech was a considerable obstacle in his way. People thought he made tremendous assumptions. It was simply an inevitable inflation through the coming up of that figure and his identification with it. Here we see an example of identification with the daemon and an ego inflation due to this identification. Ultimately, what solves this problem is becoming more conscious and understanding the psychodynamic principle of the mind. In this situation, if Nietzsche was more conscious, he would realize he is not his daemon, 
but rather he is an ego interacting with the archetype of the self. One needs to enact the principle of humbleness to avoid identifying oneself with God. In emphasizing the importance of being humble, Jung says, if Nietzsche were a contemporary of mine and asked my ideas about it, I would say, be your humble self. Say you know nothing. You have no ideas. And if you feel that there is somebody who wants to talk, give him a chance. Clear out your brain and leave it a while to the old man. Then make notes of it. Take down and see what he says. And then you can make up your own mind whether your ideas fit in with it or not, but don't identify with it. Of course, the thought probably would not enter his mind to ask my advice or anybody's advice about it. So there are three principles of the mind that you must be aware of and that will help you to remain more conscious and less gripped by something you don't understand. The first is understanding that your ego is not the transpersonal or primordial creative power that flows through you. The second is by being humble. You put your ego in its proper position and in right relationship with the transpersonal archetype of the self. And thirdly, by rendering your service and being a vessel for the work to be produced through you, you are allowing consciousness to give expression to the unconscious purposes. You are giving birth to God to put a twist on Jesus' saying, who sees you sees the work of the daemon. This video is designed to help you navigate this process so you don't just spiral off into something you don't understand. There is immense value hidden in the unconscious, especially when it comes to the creative function, as that is where all the true value comes from. So this is a worthwhile process that can really change your life. But it's also a dangerous one, so you have to understand the principles of the mind so you can navigate through these dark paths. This is no modern fairy tale. This is more like an old school fairy tale that has elements that are dark and twisted. Jung understood this. That's why he referred to his number two personality as morbid. So what about Jung's daemon? Let's explore that for a little bit before I go into exploring Jung's idea of the libido, the death and birth cycle, and how we can also see this in modern psychological models. For Jung, Philemon was his personification of the wise old man archetype. That is to say, Philemon was Jung's daemon. We can see Jung adopting the principle of humbleness and disassociation when he says, When I have an idea that the wise old man has his hands in something, I try to go back to my humble self and make sure that I am in no way identical with him. There is this interesting passage in Memories, Dreams, Reflections where Jung talks about the numinous power of the archetypes. He describes them as an attribute of instinct and possessing a specific energy compelling modes of behavior or impulses and that under certain circumstances have a possessive or obsessive form which Jung refers to as numinosity. And on the archetypes, Jung says, the conception of them as daemonia is therefore quite in accord with their nature. This helps us understand the numinous nature of archetypes, as they are like a daemon, working upon us, filling us full of numinous psychic or mental energy to act out a particular task or assignment, possessing us to do such and such a thing. Likewise, the connection of the archetype within the daemon helps us understand more about the daemon. We can see this when Jung says, this instinct comes to us from within, as a compulsion or will or command. And if, as has more or less been done from time immemorial, we give it the name of a personal daemon, we are at least aptly expressing the psychological situation. And if, by employing the concept of the archetype, we attempt to define a little more closely the point at which the daemon grips us, we have not abolished anything only approach closer to the source of life. From this we can see that merely explaining the experience of the daemon by invoking the concept of the archetype, according to Jung, does not abolish the existence of the daemon. It is merely a different name for the same experience. We can essentially see Jung say the same thing about God when he says, If, therefore, we speak of God as an archetype, we are saying nothing about his real nature but are letting it be known that God already has a place in that part of our psyche which is pre-existent to consciousness and that therefore he cannot be considered an invention of consciousness. We neither make him more remote or eliminate him, but bring him closer to the possibility of being experienced. Essentially, what Jung is doing here 
is he is placing God or the daemon as real lived experiences in the context of his psychology, which seeks to articulate the primordial unconscious psyche. He doesn't use the primordial unconscious psyche to explain away God or the daemon. In fact, he says, by positing the idea of the archetype, we bring God or the daemon closer to the possibility of being experienced. This is because we can understand that God and daemon are synonyms for the unconscious, and the unconscious being an earlier evolutionary stage that pre-existed before our consciousness, lets us know that our ego rests upon a backdrop of the unknown. This kind of description feels understandable and brings into our world of possibility the idea of the transpersonal mind, the aspect of mind that the ego rests upon, the aspect of mind that is the great unknown. And when we begin to understand the transpersonal aspect of mind, we understand where God or the daemon resides. And if we understand where he resides, we understand better how to build that connection and draw closer. Jung developed a strong connection with his daemon. We can see this when he says, I have had much trouble in living with my ideas. There was a daemon in me, and in the end its presence proved decisive. It overpowered me, and if I was at times ruthless, it was because I was in the grip of the daemon. I could never stop at anything once attained. I had to hasten on to catch up with my vision. Since my contemporaries, understandably, could not perceive my vision, they saw only a fool rushing ahead. And in another passage, Jung says, The daemon of creativity has ruthlessly had its way with me. The idea of the daemon also links with the creative function and is very much associated with creative work and creative people. In this respect, Jung says, a creative person has little power over his own life. He is not free. He is captive and driven by his daemon. We can see here that the creative person is captive by the daemon to fulfill a particular purpose, to render service to the creation of something. As you give birth to this creation, you realize the fullness of the potential within you. As you bring what is within you into actuality, you yourself are transformed. We can see this principle taught by the Gnostic Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, where he says, If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. This idea of the daemon is one of having something within you that you have to bring forth. But you can choose not to listen to the daemon. Just like someone refuses to take on a warning from a dream that has arisen from the unconscious, this will bring someone into a psychodynamic state where their conscious mind is at odds with their unconscious, leading to all sorts of disasters. This idea of bringing forth what is within you is paramount to who you are and who you are to become. Do you have what it takes? Do you have that special thing inside of you that you must bring forth? I have a similar idea that may help you see this through a slightly different lens. It is this. God did not create the world. He became God through the act of creating the world. You see, so when you bring forth what is within you, at that point you actually become yourself. Because what you bring forth shapes you. To achieve something great or difficult is not simply about the outward benefit you receive at the end, but the inherent reward you gain through what that process made of you. This means you must create in order to become yourself. In order to actualize the true pattern of your nature, you must create. And through that process, you will be transformed. And what you give birth to will create you. You will be substantiated in the world through your creation. This is why self-actualization is linked to creativity and becoming one with God. Think about this from a practical point of view. Without being a creator, you cannot be yourself, because if you don't create anything original from yourself, you are destined to live within the creation of someone else. Your entire existence operates within the framework of someone else's ideas. Ideas govern the world. Ideas govern our lives. Whose ideas are you living? If you were living someone else's ideas, you were not living as yourself. You were living as them. You must create your own ideas. Then you will have opened up a space for you to live out that idea, to become yourself. Think of the difference between a successful business owner and an employee. 
the successful business owner thought up their own idea to create something out of themselves. As the business is successful, it has been substantiated in the world, allowing the owner to live on what they created out of themselves. The price was that the business owner becomes the business. The employee, on the other hand, is paid in exchange for being told what to do, say, and think. Their life rests within the bounds of someone else's idea, and all their work and energy is in servitude to that other person's vision, becoming what someone else has made them. They don't have to create anything new, only follow instructions. The price is they become what they are paid to do. After all, what you do, say, and think over and over again becomes your personality. Consequently, you are either shaped from within or shaped from the outside. This is a bit of a crude analogy, but it makes this idea hit home. Jung has an example that further illustrates this process of creation and further articulates this idea from the perspective of the unconscious, where he says, The creative process has a feminine quality, and the creative work arises from unconscious depths, we might truly say from the realm of the mothers. Whenever the creative force predominates, life is ruled and shaped by the unconscious rather than by the conscious will, and the ego is swept along on an underground current, becoming nothing more than a helpless observer of events. The progress of the work becomes the poet's fate and determines his psychology. It is not Goethe that creates Faust, but Faust that creates Goethe. And what is Faust? Faust is essentially a symbol. We see here the more esoteric end of this idea, where Jung lets us know what exactly it is that we are creating or bringing forth or giving birth to. We are bringing forth a symbol of the psyche. We can see this further explained when Jung says, The organ of perception, the soul, apprehends the contents of the unconscious and, as the creative function, gives birth to its dynamis in the form of a symbol. The soul gives birth to images that from the rational standpoint of consciousness are assumed to be worthless, and so they are, in the sense that they cannot immediately be turned to account in the objective world. The first possibility of making use of them is artistic, if one is in any way gifted in that direction. The symbol is creating you and shaping you from the unconscious. That is why this unconscious force takes over. That's why the daemon grips you. It doesn't take over for no reason. It takes over to give birth through the creative work. Once given birth, the symbol helps heal and redeem the broader culture. In this way, its purpose goes beyond the individual's life. We can see this when Jung says, in this way, the work of the artist meets the psychic needs of the society in which he lives, and therefore means more than his personal fate, whether he is aware of it or not. Being essentially the instrument of his work, he is subordinate to it, and we have no right to expect him to interpret it for us. He has done his utmost by bringing it form, and must leave the interpretation to others and to the future. Now, we are going to go through how to harness the energy and power from the unconscious, how to access it how to understand its ebbs and flows, and how to use the psychodynamic principle of the mind to direct the unconscious energy towards the surface, towards consciousness. This process is no different to saying, you are going to learn how to release your creative daemon. The result is, you will experience this numinous energy and power, and you will be filled with a feeling of life and strength. As we go through this, I will also link Jung's work and his conception of the libido with other contemporary theories of motivation in psychology. I do this simply to add another lens to further understand these ideas in a practical context, so that you can feel like this is something you can actually implement and that it is not just theoretical. This layering of different theories helps us circle around the idea, performing what Jung called a circumambulation, because there is a correspondence between Jung's concept of the libido and contemporary motivational psychology, we know it is built on solid ground. This layering of corresponding ideas also performs the function of what Jung calls an amplification, as the idea is further amplified and we get to experience it from a different perspective. We see more of the whole and we connect more with the idea that way. No one else has connected these ideas like I have here for you, which means you are on the cutting edge if you take time to learn and integrate this into your life. This is my gift to you, or should I say, my daemon's gift to you. The connections I can see that no one has articulated yet, and these connections aren't trivial. They will help you unlock the daemon. They will help you to reconnect with the power within you.
The first piece of the puzzle can be found in an overlooked passage by Jung, where he says, Perhaps I might say, I need people to a higher degree than others, and at the same time much less. When the daemon is at work, one is always too close and too far away. Only when it is silent can one achieve moderation. The wider context to this passage is that Jung describes himself as being ruthless at times when it came to social relationships. He talks about being deeply interested in people for a period of time, while they gave him some insight into psychology, but as soon as he saw through them, or he felt they did not understand him, he would move on very quickly. And Jung here attributes this behavior to his daemon. When Jung says, when the daemon is at work, one is always too close and too far away, we can see this relates to Jung's regulation of social distance from others. In other words, Jung's attachment versus his autonomy. The Zurich model of social motivation developed by Biscoff arose to explain and predict processes of social distance regulations. For our purposes, we are going to use the Zurich model of social motivation to see exactly when the daemon is at work. As we know, it is at work when one is always too close and too far. These social distance regulatory processes have been described by attachment theory, such as the well-known theories developed by Bowlby on developing attachments with one's primary caregiver, usually the mother. However, the Zurich model of social motivation has broader explanatory power and can be understood as a cybernetic extension of attachment theory integrated with theories of optimal arousal and coping theories, as well as having a mathematical underpinning. The Zurich model explains how attachments, arousal, power, also known as autonomy, and coping systems dynamically interact. This model can be applied to the distance regulation of adults, such as their approach avoidance tendencies and behaviors in romantic partnerships. The model postulates three basic motivational systems, the security, the arousal, and the autonomy system. And if one of these systems is blocked and cannot operate like usual, then there is a fourth system, the coping system. We can also map the model onto the movements of Jung's concept of the libido energy as described through various mythological motifs. The core dilemma of social distance regulation theories can be illustrated by Schopenhauer's porcupine parable on human connection. The porcupine parable says that on a cold day, a group of porcupines huddled together seeking warmth. However, the closer they move together, the more they hurt each other with their spines, and so they veer away from each other until the need for warmth prevails and they search each other out again. Schopenhauer's porcupine dilemma highlights the primordial conflict between intimacy and autonomy. Likewise, the Zurich model of social motivation postulates that these two drives are antagonistic to each other. The security system regulates the need for safety and relatedness while the autonomy system regulates the need for independence, freedom, and self-determined behavior. When the security system detects that dependency exceeds security, needs for safety and relatedness are maintained and attachment behavior is exhibited, which is when a person seeks to reduce the distance with the person who is able to provide security. The autonomy system, on the other hand, is said to activate once a person reaches early adolescence. The autonomy system modulates the security system and the arousal system mentioned a while ago. It inhibits dependency and enhances the arousal system. High levels of self-efficacy develop through increases in a person's sense of achievement and competence from successfully solving problems or being praised by others increases the drive for autonomy and with it the need for arousal, while needs for safety and relatedness are turned down. This link with self-efficacy and the drive for autonomy and arousal means that when we have a high sense of our own competence and achievement, we are likely to feel more self-determined and less dependent on others. Research on the modulating effect of self-efficacy on aesthetic judgments revealed that there is a preference for ambivalent, more complex, and original pieces of art in those with higher levels of self-efficacy. This illustrates Jung's condition when his daemon was at work. As Jung was a highly self-efficacious and competent individual, fascinated with the puzzle of people's psychology until he figured them out and they became simple, and his drive for autonomy and stimulation were activated again, ruthlessly leaving behind those he once found fascinating. Just as we see in these motivational theories, we will see in Jung's psychology and in mythology how competence and self-efficacy is what is needed to achieve autonomy and self-determined creation, 
led by the creative daemon. We can see the need for competence and high self-efficacy when Jung says, As I have said, only the man who has outgrown the stages of consciousness belonging to the past and has amply fulfilled the duties appointed to him by his world can achieve full consciousness of the present. To do this, he must be sound and proficient in the best sense, a man who has achieved as much as other people and even a little more. It is these qualities that enable him to gain the next highest level of consciousness. He must be proficient in the highest degree, for unless he can atone by creative ability for his break with tradition, he is merely disloyal to the past. To perform the work the daemon has for you to complete, you must be a highly competent and self-efficacious person that also has highly developed creative abilities to bring creations into existence. You have to do your part in developing your character, skills, and abilities. This is necessary so that the daemon can use you to bring forth new creations. As you become more competent, you will also become less dependent on others, resulting in the maximization of your autonomy in all realms of life, giving you the freedom to create great work and bring forth what is within you. Let's now dive into Jung's psychology of the libido and his cross-analysis of mythology, and after each passage I'll explain the dynamics so you can understand it and also apply these principles to your own life. In talking about the libido in connection with the mother, Jung says, The forward-striving libido, which rules the conscious mind of the son, demands separation from the mother, but his childish longing for her prevents this by setting up a psychic resistance that manifests itself in all kinds of neurotic fears, that is to say, in a general fear of life. The more a person shrinks from adapting himself to reality, the greater becomes the fear which increasingly besets his path at every point. Thus a vicious circle is formed. Fear of life and people causes more shrinking back, and this in turn leads to infantilism and finally into the mother. Jung here is describing the process of an adolescent who has become of age, the point at which he is meant to separate from his mother and adapt properly as his own individual to the world. This process is something we all go through when we leave the safety, security, and attachment of our family and become more independent, self-directed, and adapted or established in the world. If during this vital stage of development you shrink back from adapting to the world, you become fearful, and when you are fearful, you will seek the security of the mother again, remaining in your attachment to the mother and destroying all hope of achieving autonomy. Jung further explains this process and the dangers of remaining attached to the mother, where he says, Such a sacrifice can only be accomplished through wholehearted dedication to life. All the libido that was tied up in family bonds must be withdrawn from the narrower circle into the larger one, because the psychic health of the adult individual who in childhood was a mere particle revolving in a rotary system demands that he should himself become the center of a new system. That such a step includes the solution, or at least some consideration, of the sexual problem is obvious enough, for unless this is done, the unemployed libido will inevitably remain fixed in the unconscious endogamous relationship to the parents and will seriously hamper the individual's freedom. We must remember that Christ's teaching means ruthlessly separating a man from his family, and we saw in the Nicodemus Dialogue how he took a special pains to give regression a symbolic meaning. Both tendencies serve the same goal, namely that of freeing man from his family fixations, from his weakness and uncontrolled infantile feelings. For if he allows his libido to get stuck in a childish milieu and does not free it for higher purposes, he falls under the spell of unconscious compulsion. Wherever he may be, the unconscious would then recreate the infantile milieu by projecting his complexes, thus reproducing all over again, and in defiance of his vital interests, the same dependence and lack of freedom which formerly characterized his relations with his parents. His destiny no longer lies in his own hands. This is a great layering of ideas from Jung that articulates the need to sacrifice the attachments of our family. Or in other words, we sacrifice the libido built up in the unconscious that relates to our mother or family. We do this through adopting a wholehearted dedication to life, allowing for the libido to rise up from the unconscious and to help us to establish ourselves in a new psychological atmosphere. 
This happens when we take responsibility as an individual and we exercise our autonomy and freedom, as we are now psychologically a separate person from our family, because our libido has been freed from our unconscious attachments to them and has now been transferred to the forward-striving conscious mind. This process helps a person to develop a stable ego and adapt properly to the world. After this takes place, however, another process begins. Jung talks about this second process when he says, We saw earlier on that the mother libido must be sacrificed in order to create the world. Here, the world is destroyed by renewed sacrifice of the same libido, which once belonged to the mother and then passed into the world. The horse, therefore, may reasonably be substituted as a symbol for this libido, because as we saw, it has numerous connections with the mother. The sacrifice of the horse can only produce another phase of introversion similar to that which prevailed before the creation of the world. This is a key passage by Jung that articulates the multiple movements and sacrifices of the libido to help the person along their psychological development. The first sacrifice of the mother libido occurs when we establish ourselves as an individual and adapt to the world. The second sacrifice of this same libido that has now helped us establish ourselves in the world occurs through a process of introversion, where the libido is taken back from the world and into the unconscious. The mother imago, however, represents the unconscious, and it is as much a vital necessity for the unconscious to be joined to the conscious as it is for the latter not to lose contact with the unconscious. Nothing endangers this connection more in a man than a successful life. It makes him forget his dependence on the unconscious. The case of Gilgamesh is instructive in this respect. He was so successful that the gods, the representatives of the unconscious, saw themselves compelled to deliberate how they could best bring about his downfall. Their efforts were unavailing at first, but when the hero had won the herb of immortality and was almost at his goal, a serpent stole the elixir of life from him while he slept. The demands of the unconscious act at first like a paralyzing poison on a man's energy and resourcefulness, so that it may well be compared to the bite of a poisonous snake. Apparently, it is a hostile demon who robs him of energy, but in actual fact, it is his own unconscious whose alien tendencies are beginning to check the forward striving of the conscious mind. The cause of this process is often extremely obscure, the more so as it is complicated by all kinds of external factors and subsidiary causes, such as difficulties in work, disappointments, failures, reduced efficacy due to age, depressing family problems, and so on and so forth. According to the myths, it is the woman who secretly enslaves a man so that he can no longer free himself from her and becomes a child again. During this second sacrifice of the mother libido, we see even a person of great strength, a person with a highly developed ego, one who is successful in the world, is forced to recognize their dependence on the unconscious forces. Such a person is paralyzed by the poisonous snake within. I can attest to this process through my own dreams and warn anyone to be careful when they see the snake within. This process is necessary as it performs the dissolution of the current configuration of your personality. As the mother libido flows within, through the psychological mechanism of introversion, a great battle takes place, a wrestling with God, a struggle that can end in life or death. It is in this inner battle that you confront your daemon. We can further understand this process when Jung says, Mondamin, the friend of man, challenges Hiawatha to single combat in the glow of evening, in the purple twilight of the setting sun, i.e. in the western land, there now ensues the mythological struggle with the god who has sprung out of the unconscious like a transformed reflection of Hiawatha's introverted consciousness. As a god or god-man, he is the prototype of Hiawatha's heroic destiny. That is to say, Hiawatha has in himself the possibility, indeed, the necessity of confronting his daemon. On the way to his goal, he conquers the parents and breaks his infantile ties, but the deepest tie is to the mother. Once he has conquered this by gaining access to her symbolical equivalent, he can be born again. In this tie to the maternal source lies the strength that gives the hero his extraordinary powers, his true genius, 
which he frees from the embrace of the unconscious by his daring and sovereign independence. Thus, the God is born in him. The mystery of the mother is divine creative power, which appears here in the form of the corn god, Mondamin. We can see here the process of being born again. You must break your infantile ties to your parents by becoming independent from them and separating yourself from your actual family. But as the deepest tie is to the mother, one has to replace this tie with her symbolical equivalent. That is, you must connect with the archetype of the mother in the form of a psychological symbol within the unconscious. You do this through your journey into the unconscious, through the psychological mechanism of introversion. You will encounter representations of the unconscious and you develop a connection through them. The representations can come in many forms through dreams and inner visions. This can begin with the descent into hell through the mouth of a dragon, to the underworld in the belly of a whale at the bottom of the ocean, or the slaying of a beast that leads to a transformation, or the representations could come in a more positive form, such as experiencing a nurturing and caring figure or other powerful feminine characters like a goddess or magical woman. The archetype of the mother can come in many positive or negative forms, but the key is to remain in connection with the inner development of the symbol produced by the unconscious, because this is where the power and genius comes from. This is the source of the creativity of the daemon, and you want to attract the libido energy back up to consciousness by taking on that heroic destiny, by engaging in that struggle with the daemon, by taking up the call to fulfill your purpose, by being the vessel that allows the creative function to bring new things into being, by being born again, by giving birth to the God within. This is beautifully articulated by Jung when he says, The battle in the sunset with the corn god gives Hiawatha new strength. Necessarily so, because the fight against the paralyzing grip of the unconscious calls forth a man's creative powers. That is the source of all creativity, but it needs heroic courage to do battle with these forces and to wrest from them the treasure hard to attain. Whoever succeeds in this has triumphed indeed. Hiawatha wrestles with himself in order to create himself. To become yourself, you must go through the process of psychological transformation. This is the process of death and rebirth. This is the process of self-creation. If you do not break away from the tradition and your societal conditioning, you cannot create something new. This is the dying part of the process. If you don't create something new, you don't complete the birthing part of the process and you don't give birth to yourself. You yourself must be transformed and born again in order to create great things and bring them into the world. We can see this when Jung says, Whenever some great work is to be accomplished, before which a man recoils, doubtful of his strength, his libido streams back to the fountainhead. And that is the dangerous moment when the issue hangs between annihilation and new life. For if the libido gets stuck in the wonderland of this inner world, then for the upper world, man is nothing but a shadow. He is El Roth, the unconscious, to be eddy, moribound, or at least seriously ill. But if the libido manages to tear itself loose and force its way up again, something like a miracle happens. The journey to the underworld was a plunge into the fountain of youth, and the libido, apparently dead, wakes to renewed fruitfulness. The libido is drawn towards archetypally charged situations and analogies that are in tune with instinctual processes. You can use this knowledge to help you release your creative daemon or call up the libido energy from the unconscious to put it towards creating new things and transforming the world around you. We can do this through the function of creative fantasy that produces creative analogies that attract the libido and creative power towards it. We can see this process explained when Jung says, we find that creative fantasy is continually engaged in producing analogies to instinctual processes in order to free the libido from sheer instinctuality by guiding it towards analogical ideas. These systems have to be constituted in such a way that they offer the libido a kind of natural gradient. For the libido does not incline to anything. Otherwise, it would be possible to turn it in any direction one chose. 
but that is the case only with voluntary processes, and then only to a limited degree. The libido has, as it were, a natural penchant. It is like water, which must have a gradient if it is to flow. The nature of these analogies is therefore a serious problem, because as we have said, they must be ideas which attract the libido. Their special character is, I believe, to be discerned in the fact that they are archetypes, that is, universal and inherited patterns, which taken together constitute the structure of the unconscious. When Christ, for instance, speaks to Nicodemus of spirit and water, these are not just random ideas, but typical ones, which have always exerted a powerful fascination on the mind. Christ is here touching on the archetype, and that, if anything, will convince Nicodemus, for the archetypes are the forms or riverbeds along which the current of psychic life has always flowed. You have permission to play like a child, to play with your fantasy function. Let your imagination start to play and unfold its creations. We can see Jung emphasize the value of this process when he says, not the artist alone, but every creative individual whatsoever owes all that is greatest in his life to fantasy. The dynamic principle of fantasy is play, a characteristic also of the child, and as such it appears inconsistent with the principle of serious work. But without this playing with fantasy, no creative work has ever yet come to birth. The debt we owe to the play of imagination is incalculable. Go for a walk and start wandering around, or lay down somewhere comfortable. Let your mind wander off into a daydream, and see what new ideas and thoughts begin to emerge in your mind. Write them down, start playing with them, have fun playing with your creations. And I'll leave you with these words from Jung, where he says, The creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct acting from inner necessity, the creative mind plays with the object it loves. If you want more insights on how to activate the creative function, I just released a full-length audio lesson on my Patreon about creativity, where I go through my personal creative process in greater detail. To gain access, go to patreon.com forward slash Jared Chan.